Chapter 4 Some three or four years earlier, Coopers had sold out to the Wellcome Foundation to operate alongside Burroughs Wellcome, BW, whose products, except for veterinary vaccines, were mainly human pharmaceuticals. I explored what distributors BW might have in Africa and discovered they used Morrison's Son and Johnson, M, S and J. So I went to see M, S and J in London and they were agreeable that I should go and talk to their branches in Accra and Lagos. Meantime, I needed secretarial help to deal with the increasing workload I was receiving from the Cooper export executives. Jeff Lancashire's pool of secretaries all seemed to be good-looking, well-built girls, and he lent me one of them. In Nairobi, secretaries were called by their Christian names, and I saw no reason to change this habit. Before long, I started to hear BGH prowling around in the empty office next to mine. Did he think the use of Christian names meant undue familiarity was going on? Anyway, soon she left, and it was suggested that perhaps I might consider Mrs. Wright. Mrs. Wright, a widow with two young sons, was reputed to be an efficient secretary. However, no one wanted her because she was difficult and could be rude. Perhaps she's a 100 percenter, I thought. Anyway, Mrs. Wright, a small, tough, no-nonsense-looking woman, came and sat in front of me. I showed not a lot of interest, aware of her reputation, which is why she was now having an interview with me, a comparatively junior executive. I smiled at her and asked, Would you mind if I call you by your Christian name? She nearly fell off her chair. Nobody ever suggested this before. Secretaries were called by their surnames. A broad smile slowly spread across her face, and I knew I had the right person. She just took me over. Everything she did was efficient, timely, and loyally performed. She was dynamic, adding enormously to my work output. And she was reliable, truthful, full of integrity. A 100 percenter. Phil knew everyone in Cooper's, top to bottom. She knew how to deal with the different power blocks. She soon showed how she would deal with me. After an overseas trip, I was at my desk when she came in with her shorthand notepad. She sat down in front of my desk. What's the matter, Phil? I'm waiting to take down your report of your trip. But I've only just got back. I haven't got my notes brained together yet. Well, I'm not moving until you've dictated your report to me. She was right, of course. Given the chance, I would delay it. She probably knew of the research that claimed, delay a report a week and you've forgotten half of it. PGH was a fluent Spanish speaker, as were others of his executives. Consequently, the export department tended to concentrate its work on Spain and the Spanish-speaking countries of South America. Since I'd lived 12 years in Kenya, it seemed reasonable for, to PGH that he should ask me to explore the possibilities in West Africa. This would really be territorial work rather than product work, but I couldn't refuse. Meantime, my mind had been wandering around the Cooper aerosol business. Ron Lee had come across an American development that created timed aerosol emissions. Equipment filled with the aerosol could be made to last a month while keeping a large volume of air free of flying insects. Ron had circumvented the patent on the American invention and he was increasingly confident of his equipment. He called it the Coopermatic. It seemed to me here was a real opportunity for someone to live a product and develop its distribution worldwide, a classic product marketing venture. I mentioned this to JKW and he was encouraging. So I might be able to rely on sales impetus from the Cooper overseas companies. Meantime, I had this West African trip to plan and execute. Flights to West Africa were not frequent. They could be as few as twice a week. So, eventually, I arranged for this first trip to include Liberia, Nigeria, 
Ghana and Sierra Leone. It would take six weeks. A month before departure, my throat swelled up and was very painful. I went and saw Dr. Adams, who prescribed a course of penicillin. A week later, there was no improvement. This time, Dr. Adams was not available. Seeing that the penicillin had produced no good result, David Thallon prescribed a course of tetracycline. A week later, the throat was as bad as ever. Dr. Adams looked at it. What's the matter with you? he asked. Well, with respect, you can see. No, I mean, you're going on a business trip to West Africa, aren't you? Yes, that's right. Are you afraid of going back to Africa? And your wife's pregnant, isn't she? No reply. Look, you've had full courses of penicillin and tetracycline. He took a small packet from a drawer. Here's a sedative. Take it and I don't expect to see you back here. I was astonished and angry. He was a canny old doctor who had been around the world, and within three days the swelling had disappeared. A few days after that, having bid a fond farewell to Jane and the boys, I was on an aeroplane bound for Robertsville, Liberia's airport. Founded in 1821 as a refuge for slaves from the USA southern states, Liberia had been in reality an American colony and had joined us in the war against Germany and Japan. Coopers were now offering a tropical suit allowance. So I was looking very smart in my Hector Pau suit when I arrived just after midnight on the Friday morning. There was no relevant flight due out until Monday morning. So although one day's discussion with a new potential distributor was likely to be enough, I was going to have three days in Liberia. Out of the plane came a loud, breezy, confident American, two oriental gentlemen and myself. There were maybe three taxis hovering forlornly out front. Ever been here before? asked the American. No, I said. Well, you come with me. We'll share a cab into Monrovia. Let me do the negotiating. Where are you going? I named a Lebanese hotel that I'd had recommended, cheaper than the one vast American hotel that I'd heard stood up high on a cliff on the outskirts of Monrovia. OK, I've sorted them out, said Jack, my new American friend. Away we go. Jack and I climbed into the back of number one cab. The two quiet, disciplined oriental gentlemen were making arrangements with some difficulty with driver of number two cab. So Jack and I careered off into the black of the West African night, leaving Robertsville's few lights and number two cab far behind us. Soon our cabbie found he had a problem. The cab was slewing around all over the road. Taking both hands off the wheel, he reached for his spectacles, which were on the seat beside him. To no avail. I could see in the dim headlights we were still swerving at speed from one side of the road to the other. Muttering oaths in his best West African kitchen English, the cabbie brought the cab to a halt, found a wheel brace and tightened the nuts on both front wheels. Now he climbed back in confidently and off we went again. Don't worry, this is normal, shouted Jack over the noise of the cab juddering along the dust road. I was just thinking that perhaps the ride would not be too bad after all when the engine died and the cab slowed to a halt. This car no fit move em. This car um, have no gas. We wait here small time, proclaimed the cabbie. What? I shouted. I imagined us, Mau Mau style, being set up for a ritual execution of some kind and prepared to open my door and run out into the bush. No, no, don't worry. This is par for the course, said Jack. I don't believe it. Oh, the cabbies rarely have the cash to put in enough gas. What? I was not amused. Cab number two, its two oriental gentlemen sitting stoically in the back, appeared from behind and pulled up alongside. There followed a verbal exchange between the two cabbies. They agreed that our cabbie should go off into the night in cab number two to find a can of petrol. 
Oh, there's no way I'm putting up with this. Relax, buddy. He'll come back. Hello. With the greatest reluctance, I sank back, helpless and hopeless, into the back of our cab, as cab number two disappeared. But Jack was right. Ten minutes or so later, in cab number two, with its two oriental gentlemen in the back, our cabbie reappeared with a can of petrol. The contents he emptied into our tank as cab number two disappeared on the road to Monrovia. We followed, arriving after 2 a.m. Jack climbed out at his cliffside hotel and the cabbie set about delivering me. We stopped at a crossing. The cabbie suddenly leaned across the passenger seat and called out through the open window to a girl he had noticed. Nice girl, you like out lonesome at night like this is bad. He called as he opened the passenger door and pulled in the barely protesting girl. You come by me. Me look after this girl, he confided. And so off we went, the three of us, to my hotel where the cabbie cheerfully dropped me off. Through Friday morning, I discussed business potential with the distributor. After lunch, having looked around town, I got to bed early. I awoke in the early hours of Saturday morning to note with surprise that my bedroom was quite light. Slowly, my sleep-fogged eyes noticed that the light on the wall of my room was flickering. Rushing to the window, I could see the block on the other side of the road was going up in flames. Hastily, I packed my bags and carried them downstairs through the lobby and out into the pavement where I joined other hotel guests. My cine camera was able to record that the whole block was now ablaze, with flames 20 to 30 feet high and more. Eventually, an officer of the fire brigade arrived in his official car, got out, walked around, talked to one or two bystanders and drove away again. Well, he didn't look too concerned, I commented. Oh, the block is owned by Lebanese. He's not going to bust a gut for them, came the reply. After another 20 minutes or so, the fire had really taken a complete hold. The fire engine arrived, but it had not had time to fill up apparently. It sprayed enough water to wash a car with and disappeared again. By dawn, the whole block was a smouldering hulk, with young African looters moving quickly in and out. One came out opposite me with his loot under his jacket. Meeting a fellow looter, he opened his coat to reveal with pride what he had pilfered. Me done steal em, he boasted. Me done steal em too, came the reply from the other youngster as he revealed his pickings. Anyway, the flames had not reached my hotel. I went back to my room and then down for breakfast. Thinking that the weekend must henceforward seem rather tame and boring, I bought a newspaper to see what other entertainment might be on offer. I read with interest that the US Davis Cup players Alan Fox and Dennis Rolston were due that afternoon to play an exhibition match at the National Tennis Stadium. I asked where this was and receiving rather vague answers I left plenty of time after lunch to look for it on foot. Eventually, after fruitless searches, I was wandering up a tree-lined lane when I happened to pass a corrugated iron fence with some holes in it. Through them I could see a concrete tennis court with cracks in it and a net containing a sizeable hole. This can't be it, I said to myself. Just at that moment a convoy of vehicles drove up and through the corrugated iron gateway. Out of a van poured a dozen or so youngsters and a well-turned-out adult who I discovered later was the national coach. The youngsters were his national squad. I eased my way in and sat on a raised bench with twenty or thirty other spectators. Eventually Ralston, later to be a Wimbledon finalist and US Davis Cup captain, and Fox, later to be a Wimbledon quarter-finalist, arrived. After a brief introduction and knock-up, they then played their demonstration match, and a needle match they made of it. Only Americans, I thought, could play a highly competitive match thousands of miles from home on a cracked concrete court with a hold net. 
What heroes! Occasionally there was a smattering of applause. Some of the youth squad had brought comics which they were reading openly. On Sunday morning I walked out into town and was delighted to hear a band playing. Following the sound, past some prominently positioned cops, I came to the procession, with hundreds watching. It was the US Deep South reincarnated. The men were in black suits and top hats, the women in white hats and white crinolines. They were processing to church. That afternoon I saw President Tubman's ostentatious palace. It had a large, raised, circular drive in front of it, and it was enormous. Goodness knows how many rooms it must have held. Hundreds. I moved on to the swanky hotel to see if Jack was there. He was not to be seen, but on a bar stool sat a grizzled bear of a man. Now, in my time living in East Africa and travelling to other African countries, had brought me in contact with such Europeans. The average Englishman would, I think, despise them, scorn them, laugh at them. Their only home is Africa. They were born there, have suffered the diseases and physical risks of Africa. Typically, they have never travelled outside Africa. They have little to live on and yet somehow manage to move their way from country to country, working at sundry jobs for which they are paid and receive sympathetic handouts. I had always warmed to these people. Perhaps I saw myself as potentially one of them if I hadn't met and married my totally reliable Jane. We started talking. He said he'd been born in southwest Africa and had moved from country to country, working mainly on the trapping of game for movement into game parks or shipment off to overseas zoos. His punchline to fascinate me and earn me another drink was to talk about lions. He vowed that the way to subdue and pacify lion cubs was to work up a good sweat and then hold them by the scruffs of their necks under one's armpits. Eventually, I extricated myself from his oral embrace and made my way back to my hotel for my last night before setting off for Nigeria.